The Prophet was a human and by, by every description, by every definition through his entire life, his entire life was a display of him being a perfect human. And some of the natural qualities of a, of a human is that we have emotions. And emotions can be displayed through two specific methods. Either you're happy or you're sad. Either you're joyful or you're grieving. And the Prophet was similar. So this topic is the smile and the cry of the Prophet ﷺ. Moments in the life of the Prophet where he would smile and moments in the life of the Prophet ﷺ where he would cry, where he would weep, where he would shed tears. The first narration is a Sahaba mentioning that the Prophet ﷺ, I came to the Prophet ﷺ and he was praying. And when he was praying, I turned towards him and all I saw was the Prophet weeping and his beard full of tears. Another narration goes by where Aisha radiallahu anha says, the Prophet entered into my room and he laid down next to me. And whilst he laid down next to me, he turned towards me and he said, Ya Aisha, will you give me permission to pray Salat? Aisha radiallahu anha says, there was nothing in my life that was more dear to me than the closeness of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet laying next to me. And he asked you, can I just leave you for a few moments because I want to pray Salat? So Aisha Allah says, there was nothing more dear to me and more beloved to me than being next to the Prophet himself. But when he asked me, I replied by saying, Ya Rasulullah, I love what I want, but I love more so than what I want what you want. So whatever you want, go ahead and do it. So the Prophet stood up, and Aisha narrates that he starts praying. And as he starts his prayer, she's observing this prayer. She says he starts reciting, and as he starts reciting, his tears start strolling down his cheeks, his beard becomes full of tears, and then he goes into ruku, and his ruku is as long as his qiyam, and he continues to cry. And then he goes into sajda, and he continues to cry, until the entire area that he was doing sajda upon, that area, that land, that earth, became wet and moist due to his tears. They would say about Umar anhu that when someone would stand in the area that he would pray to Hajjud in the morning, it was as if someone threw an entire bucket of water at that musalla. That's how much he would cry at night. So she says he continues to cry until Bilal calls the adhan. And another narration similar to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is in Sahih Muslim, sends down Jibreel alayhi salam from the skies and he says to Jibreel, ask the Prophet why he cries so much. Of course Allah knows, but this story is mimicked so that we can understand the exact answer of why he cried. Allah already knew, but it's for us to know. So Jibreel alayhi salam comes down and says, Ya Rasulullah, ma yubkik. Why are you crying for? The Prophet would say, if only you knew and you saw what I saw, you would laugh less and you would cry more. If we are people that enjoy laughter as we do, we should aim, hope, to strike a balance of that with that laughter through the, through the crying of the night. Or else, through excessive laughter, their heart dies and now it becomes difficult to cry. And the Prophet says, if you can't cry, tabaku, try to cry, fake it. Continue faking it until your heart becomes soft enough to cry. Nonetheless, Jibreel alayhi salam comes down and he asks, what are you crying for? And the Prophet replies and he says, How can I not cry after reciting this verse? In tu'adhibhum fa innahum ibaduk wa in taghfir lahum fa innaka anta la aziz wal hakim. Where Allah mentions the, the conversation of Isa alayhi salam with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment when Allah asks Isa that, Did you tell people to worship you and your mother? And Isa says, No. Then Allah says, What should I do with them? And Isa replies, and to them for innahum ibaduk, O Allah, if you choose to punish them, then verily they are your slaves. You can do whatever you want to them. They're your slaves. No one can question you. La yasalu amma yafalu hum yasalun. Allah can't be questioned. Wa in taghfir lahum, then Isa adds that if you forgive them, 
Well, you're the most forgiving and the most wise, oh Allah. You know why you forgave them. Even though we may not be able to understand the wisdom of why you forgave them, you can forgive them. And one of the du'as of Fath Makkah in Hajjatul Wada' where the Prophet ﷺ continued to stand for hours and later on in his life when he was asked why he was standing for so long, he said there was one specific du'a that was not accepted and I continued to stand all the way to the time of Fajr until Allah answered that du'a. And that du'a was, Oh Allah, forgive the oppressed and forgive the oppressor. Well, Allah's wisdom is that He can forgive both. Nonetheless, he says to Jibreel alayhi salam, that how can I stop crying when Allah is saying that Allah can punish my ummah? I can't sleep with them. Imam Tabri rahimullah says that it's proven that prophets love the people of their ummah more than parents love their children. If a mother can't sleep knowing that a child has to go through a procedure which is safe and secure, how can the prophet be at ease when he is thinking about people of his ummah having to go through the struggle of Jahannam. So I can't sleep. I can't enjoy. So Jibreel A.S. goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, Oh Allah, Muhammad sallallahu is crying because he's afraid of the um, for the ummah. Allah answers and says, Tell Muhammad sallallahu that Allah will never fall short of your expectations for your nation. Whatever you want for your ummah, it'll come true for you. We can count on our fingers the amount of times the Prophet cried for personal reasons. We can count them. The death of Ruqayya, the death of Zainab, the death of Ibrahim. But to count the amount of times the Prophet cried for us, it's impossible. To cry for your family is so easy. To cry for people you've never met is not even logical. But to count those moments is impossible. Every flip of the page in Shama'il, in this chapter, is the Prophet crying for the Ummah. So his tears was for the upliftment of us in the Akhirah. And his smile was for the upliftment of Sahabas in this world. He would smile despite struggling internally. So these are narrations that continue to speak about those tears throughout his entire life when he was praying in, in, in isolation. And this continued within the Khulafa. They say that the dua that is accepted beyond any other dua is a dua of a person behind the other's back. Right? When you make dua for a brother or sister without them being there. That's a dua that's accepted right away. But that happens very less. Imagine a dua for a person that's not even alive. That's a dua the Prophet would make for us. A sahaba asked the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, where do I find you on the day of judgment? That's a powerful question. In this world, whenever I want to see, see you, and whenever I want to speak to you, I can speak to you. You're accessible, you're available. But on the day of judgment, when there are millions of people, where can I find you? Where can I spot you out? The Prophet answers, that all oh, my sahaba, find me in these three places. Number one, find me upon the sirat. When people are traveling past the Sirat and they're making their way past the Sirat, above Jahannam, over Jahannam, and they're getting towards the gates of Jannah, I will be standing on, on, the, on top of the Sirat. In the beginning of Sirat, I will be moving around. Whoever is struggling to find their way past the Sirat, I will be standing there with my hands up, turning towards Allah and saying, Allahumma sallim, oh Allah, please allow these people to pass with ease. Allow them to pass. And I will have my Sahabas also helping me. And we'll be carrying people on our backs to get them across the bridge of Sirat. Allah give us the ability to pass the Sirat with ease. Sahaba Badim Abdullah ibn Rawaha, he comes home one day and he puts his head in the lap of his wife and he starts to cry. The wife asks, why are you crying for? The husband continues to cry. And the wife starts crying. So I mean, why are you crying for? And she says, whatever has made you cry has made me cry. And then the husband replies and says, Oh my wife, I'm crying because of a simple ayah that I recall and I'm reflecting upon. Which means, Allah says to us that there is not a single person that will not have to cross over Jahannam. Every single person will have to walk through Jahannam. 
They'll have to walk past Jahannam. The ayah says every single person will have to walk past it. He says to his wife, Allah does not say whether I'll be successful or not. So just thinking about that makes me weep. So Allah, the Prophet says, the first place you'll find me is on that sirat, where I'll be making dua for you. The second place you'll find me is near the mizan, where the scales are being weighed. And I'll be making dua. Oh Allah, please, make their, make their good deeds become heavier. It's not about how many good deeds we do. Allah doesn't say, whosoever has more good deeds on their scales will be given the success of Jannah. Allah says, فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ Which literally translates as, whosoever has a heavier scale. So a person may have one good deed, but that one good deed was done with such sincerity and such love for Allah that it's heavy enough and it outweighs their entire sins. So it's not about how much we do, it's about how heavy and how strong the amal and how protected the amal was. Nonetheless, the Prophet says, I'll be standing there making dua over there. And another narration, the Prophet says, when he was asked, when he informed the Sahabas about the Day of Judgment, where he says that the people will go to Adam and ask Adam, ask Allah to start a hisab. Adam will say, I can't do it, I ate the apple. They will come to Nuh and they will say, Nuh, you ask Allah. Nuh will say, I can't do it, my son, he was washed away by the storm and I, and I question the decree of Allah, I can't do it. Ibrahim will be asked, Ibrahim will say, no, no, there were moments in my life where I used a lie to protect myself in a manner of protecting my iman which is permissible. Then Musa will be asked and Musa will say, I smacked an individual, I can't walk in front of Allah right now. Isa will be asked and Isa will say, that how can I ask Allah, people worship me. And finally they will come to our Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet will be asked, O oh, Prophet of Allah, go to Allah and ask him to start hisab and the Prophet will stand up. The poet says on that day where every single criminal, including all of us, will be standing there looking around, trying to find one form of ease, one form of peace, and will look around and say, hey man, where's the outlet? How do we get out of here? Who's gonna help me today? Everyone will be calling out, who is gonna help me today? There and then the Prophet will stand up. And he will have the flag of forgiveness and the honor of speaking to Allah on that day. Yes, Musa had the honor of speaking to Allah in this world, but no one will have the honor to speak to Allah before our Habib on the day of judgment. Where he will come under the arsh of Allah and fall into sajda. And as he falls into sajda, Allah will say to him, O oh Muhammad, irfa' ra'sak. Raise your head. Ask and you will be given. Intercede and your intercession will be accepted. And he says, Ya Allah, my ummah, my people, my people. And if he didn't love us, he wouldn't cry for us. And hopefully we take some form of tangible steps to make the Prophet happy on the Day of Judgment because there will also be people Amongst the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, who the Prophet will not be happy with, right? who the Prophet will not want to see, who the Prophet will turn his face away from. Imagine on the Day of Judgment, coming to the hawth of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, where he is with his own blessed hands, filling up the cups of water and giving it to us one by one. And we go there and we stand in front of the Prophet and the Prophet comes to us and he takes out water and he's about to give it to us. And then the angels say, oh, Ya Rasulullah, that person, he changed. She changed. They weren't proud of being in your ummah. We have to be proud of every single thing the Prophet did unapologetically, regardless if logic proves it to be sane or not. Because that's my Prophet. Every single step of the Prophet was a miracle. Anything he did was so that we can have an easier life. To the extent where the Prophet was sitting and he saw a person, his soul was being taken out. He was struggling and he was in pain. And the Prophet asked the angel of death, does every person have to go through this that passes away? And the angel of death replies, of course, everyone goes through this. The Prophet said, do me a favor, man. Take all that pain and give it to me.
Abdullah ibn Mas'ud anhu is sitting down and the Prophet comes to him. Read some Quran to me. And Ibn Mas'ud says, O Prophet of Allah, do I recite Quran to you when Allah revealed the Quran to you? He says, no, no, I'm not asking you, I'm ordering. And he starts reciting Surah An-Nisa and he ends off in the ayah, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا and he stops because he hears a prophet crying and he looks up and the prophet has his hand up like this and he tells him, please stop. Mufassirun say, why was the prophet crying at this ayah? What, is this, what does this ayah mean? Was because the ayah means, O oh, oh prophet of Allah, on the day of judgment, إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ Every prophet will be made to become a witness against their nation. وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا And you will be brought to become a witness against your ummah as well. Imagine a father being told that you have to stand in court and testify against your own son so he is sentenced to life in prison. Imagine a mother being asked to stand in court against their own children. It's impossible to even think about. The Prophet loved us more than our parents. So for him to be told that you have to stand up against the people of your nation, it was heavy. The least that we can do from the love that the Prophet demanded from us is to at least be happy and be proud of him, not be apologetic about him. Yes, the sunnahs that we bring into our life is based upon our society, the difficulties of where we live. It's not that easy to, to have all the sunnahs in our life, but the most that we can do, we should bring into our life. Do whatever is easier for you, so at least some sunnah comes into our lives. May Allah bless you all.